Okay, in order to explain the trends uh, in reactivity for metals and nonmetals in the periodic table, we need to first understand trends in radius, ionization energy, and electron affinity. So let's focus first on radius. The radius of an atom is much like you would picture the radius of a circle. The distance from the nucleus to the perimeter of the atom. Well, in fact, current atomic theory doesn't define an actual perimeter of the atom, but we can measure the distance between two adjacent nuclei and then essentially cut that in half. And so the idea is that we can determine or experimentally determine the radius of an atom in such a manner. And so it is still loosely the idea of radius being the distance from the center of the circle out to the circumference. And so we need to think about what will affect the size of the atom, the radius. We think of the positive nuclei attracting negative electrons. Now, if that attraction is weak, for reasons which we'll look at, so if there's a weak force of attraction between the nucleus and the electron cloud, then that electron cloud will not be held as tightly. So this will lead to larger radius. If in fact that nuclear charge is holding the electron cloud more strongly, so if there's a stronger force of attraction, then we will see smaller radii. So we need to keep that in our mind as we explain the trends. So you'll recall from your graphing activity that you've already discovered the trends of radius down a group and across a period in the table. So can you recall going down a group how the radius of the atoms change? Hopefully you're remembering that radius increases. Now, right now that's strictly off of memory from your graphing activity. So let's explain it so that you have an understanding by which you can then explain these trends. So let's consider lithium in group one with three protons in its nucleus and three electrons distributed two and one in the first and second shells. And then perhaps potassium in period four in group one 19 protons, 2 electrons, 8 electrons, 8 electrons, 1 electron. Okay, when we're considering radius of any particle, atoms or ions, so keep this in mind, we're first going to look at the number of shells. Next, we'll look at the number of protons or the nuclear charge. And if both of those points do not lead us to the answer, then we will look at the electrons. And so I'd like you to consider or keep in mind this green box. That's the order in which we'll analyze these particles. So first we look at the shells. Here we can see in lithium that there are two shells. And we can see in the potassium that we have four shells. What's the significance of those four shells in the potassium atom? Well, certainly this one electron, in order to be attracted by these 19 protons, Right, needs to experience an attraction from the 19 protons while they are also attracting all of the inner electrons. And in fact, having three shells full of electrons is going to shield or block the attraction that the 19 protons can have for that one valence electron. Lithium, on the other hand, has fewer inner electrons with only one shell in between the nucleus and the valence shell. And so we have a greater shielding effect in the potassium atom due to the increased number of shells. So the radius of the potassium atom, or in general, as you go down the group, the radius is increasing first due to more shells, <clears throat> which is increasing the shielding effect. And as that shielding effect increases, that sets up the weaker force of attraction between the nucleus and the electron cloud. Okay, and so we have the weaker force of attraction between the nucleus and the electron cloud. 
and that's leading then to a larger radius. Okay, what's happening as we move across the period? Well, if we look at period three, for example, we have sodium with its 11 protons distributed to eight and one. And then we have chlorine over there with 17 protons distributed to eight and seven. <clears throat> 17 protons, 17 electrons. So when we first look at our comparison point for number of shells, we notice that we have three shells and three shells. So as long as you're in the same period, those atoms are going to have the same number of shells. So we cannot predict radius based on the shells. So let's look at the number of protons in the nucleus. We see 11 protons here and 17 protons here. The idea is that 17 protons have a stronger nuclear charge. More protons, more densely positive charge. And so those 17 protons will be able to attract the electrons in these shells more strongly than what the 11 protons will be able to attract. And so we have the increased nuclear charge due to the higher number of protons, and really saying either of those is fine, which is going to make for a stronger force of attraction between the nucleus and the electron cloud which therefore leads to a smaller radius. And so, as we're going across the period, radius will decrease. Okay, so let's consider now ionization energy. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron. Okay, so consider then our two sized atoms, the nuclei in the middle with the positive charge and the electrons in this cloud area around the nucleus. The outermost electron, an electron from the valence shell, how strongly will that electron be held in a larger atom? Well, ionization energy is the energy required to remove that outermost electron. So is it going to take a lot of energy to remove that or less energy? And hopefully you're thinking that since there's a weaker force of attraction between the nucleus and the electron cloud, that that's going to lead to less energy required to remove the electron or lower ionization energy. Whereas in the case of the smaller atom, we know that there's a stronger force of attraction. That's why the electron cloud is being held so tightly and therefore it's going to be much harder to remove. So this corresponds to a higher ionization energy. So we'll need to keep those relationships in mind as we consider ionization energy. So going down a group, you may recall from the graphing activity that radius and ionization energy vary inversely. So in fact, as the radius is getting larger, the ionization energy is actually decreasing. So all of the explanation that we did here, the fact that there are more shells and a greater shielding effect leads to a weaker attraction between the nucleus and the electron cloud. So I'm going to consider that all of this here is the beginning really of the explanation, so I'm not gonna rewrite it. But that leads to then less energy being required to remove an electron from the valence shell. So I'll phrase that as to remove the outermost electron. So the weaker that attraction, the less energy required to remove the outermost electron. So that's essentially a lower ionization energy. So as the atoms are getting larger down the group, it's getting easier to remove electrons. This is the lower ionization energy. What's happening going across the period? Well, if you recall the trend in radius, the atoms are getting smaller. So it's actually getting harder to remove an electron. As those atoms are getting smaller as you go across the period, that means the force of attraction is getting stronger. Recall here that the stronger force of attraction means it's gonna take more energy to remove an electron. And so our explanation for radius decreasing due to the increased nuclear charge and leading to a stronger force of attraction, essentially that part 
of this explanation here is the beginning of the explanation for ionization energy increasing across a period. Because of that increased nuclear charge and stronger force of attraction, it's actually going to require more energy to remove that outermost electron. which therefore then means a higher ionization energy. Okay, both radius and ionization energy are required to explain the trends in reactivity of metals. And that's because metals react by losing electrons. Think about all the atoms and ions you've worked with before. Metal atoms lose electrons to become stable. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove electrons and so the ionization energy and, the, and radius as the beginning of the explanation will be critical points in explaining the reactivity trends of metals. Moving on, we'll look at electron affinity. So electron affinity is, an, again, an energy value. It's the energy released when an atom gains an electron. So here's where we'll focus for nonmetals because nonmetals react by gaining electrons. This is a tough one to understand. It's important to establish in your mind the idea that more energy being released is more stabilizing for the particle, and that's essentially a, a greater affinity. If you think of the word affinity, I have a great affinity for Snickers chocolate bars. I love Snickers chocolate bars. So I would say if I walk into a store, I'm going to easily attract those Snickers chocolate bars to me. And so an atom that has a great electron affinity is going to easily attract electrons. Do you think then that the larger atom or the smaller atom will be better at attracting electrons to itself? Well, remember it's the nucleus that's responsible for attracting the nearby electrons. Positive is going to attract negative. If you have a small atom, then that nearby electron is actually closer to this nucleus then the nearby electron would be that's outside of a larger atom, just proximity. We can see that this is a greater distance here than it is in this diagram. So a stronger nuclear charge here is going to attract a nearby electron more easily than this nuclear charge will attract this nearby electron. And so having the stronger force of attraction will lead to a higher or greater affinity, higher electron affinity. So as we're moving down a group, we know that the atoms are getting larger. So what's happening to the nucleus's ability to attract those nearby electrons? Hopefully you think that there, it's getting lower. And in fact, electron affinity is decreasing as we move down the group. And so our similar explanation for radius that we had way up in the first box going down a group. So Increased shells, increased shielding effect leads to a weaker force of attraction, right? And that will mean a lower affinity for nearby electrons, which is a lower electron affinity. Now, moving across the period, the atoms are getting smaller as we go. And so those nearby electrons are actually now closer to the nucleus. And so the atom's ability to gain electrons is increasing. And so we see electron affinity increasing as we move across the period. So again, we had increased nuclear charge leading to stronger force of attraction, which makes for a smaller atom and therefore nearby electrons are more easily attracted by the nucleus. Okay, and so those are the key points uh, summarized in the table for you. Now, at the bottom here, I have a few sentences. And hopefully you can wrap your head around the concepts here. It is definitely, I think, a complex concept to understand these explanations of trends. And I encourage you not to memorize, but to really wrap your head around it, try to build your own understanding. So come in with lots of questions. I'll be happy to talk about it with you. So let's see. Metals react by, what do you think? Either losing or gaining electrons. Hopefully you're thinking that metals react 
by losing electrons. So you can either go with larger or smaller here for atoms. So I'll pick larger. So larger atoms, are larger atoms going to have higher or lower ionization energies? I'm focusing in on ionization energy because that's the energy required to remove electrons and metals are losing electrons. So electrons are being removed from the metals. So as the atoms get larger in size, that force of attraction is weaker. Therefore, it's going to be easier or less energy required to remove those electrons. So larger atoms have lower ionization energies, and this makes them more reactive. So remember your alkali metal video, right, of those alkali metals reacting with water. Certainly we saw the reactivity increase as we moved down the group. And finally here for nonmetals, they react by gaining electrons. That's right. And let's consider now smaller atoms. Smaller atoms with the nucleus, as you saw right here, with the nucleus closer than to that nearby electron are able to attract that nearby electron more easily. And therefore, there's a higher affinity. And so we have smaller atoms have higher electron affinities. And therefore, it's going to be a more reactive nonmetal, which, if you think about the trend in the halogens, we had fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, right? Where's our smallest halogen? Right up here at the top. Remember, more shells, greater shielding effect. The atoms are getting larger as we go down. Which halogen is the most reactive? Well, the smallest one, fluorine, is going to have a greater affinity for nearby electrons. Therefore, it's going to attract that nearby electron and be more reactive. And so we saw the trend in reactivity of halogens being highest up at the top. Fluorine was the most reactive. Okay, so I encourage you to revisit these notes that you've written down, think about it, come up with analogies, come up with some questions. There's no substitute for a little bit of struggle um, and persevering through that. So good luck with this and bring in your questions.